Section four of British Sea Birds by Charles Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two Plovers and Sandpipers. Part two Curlew. This species, Nemenius arquata, is not only the largest limicoline bird that frequents the coast, but also one of the best known. There are few parts of the shore during autumn and winter where an odd curly cannot be found, whilst in some localities it may be classed as absolutely common. The curly is another of those species that present little difference between summer and winter plumage, and yet the haunts it selects in summer differ very considerably from those it seeks in winter. It is a resident in the British Islands, but its numbers are very considerably increased in autumn by migrants from more northern latitudes. It may be found, as previously inferred, on almost all parts of the shore, but such beaches where wide expanses of sand, mud and broken rocks occur are specially preferred, as are also salt marshes and wet meadows close to the sea. Of all wild fowl, the curlew is one of the wariest, never allowing a close approach unless stalked with greatest care, or surprised in some unusual way, which does not often happen. In some districts where little beach is exposed during high water, the curlews will retire some distance inland, but return with remarkable punctuality as soon as the tide begins to ebb. Shingle banks and islands are also often visited between tides. Curlews when feeding are very restless birds, running and walking about the beach, seemingly in a very careless and unsuspecting manner, but sentinels are ever on the watch to sound the warning note, which sends the big, long-billed, speckled birds hurrying away to safer haunts. The curlew feeds both by day and by night, and its wild, somewhat mournful note, shrill and far-sounding, curly, curly, may repeatedly be heard during darkness. The flight of this bird is both rapid and well-sustained. Gatke, on evidence which seems absolutely conclusive, estimates its speed on certain occasions to be not less than a mile a minute, and possibly very much more. Although the curly repeatedly wades, it is not known to swim under normal circumstances, but has occasionally been seen to perch on a tree. All through the autumn and winter, the curly continues gregarious. It migrates in vast flocks and frequently associates with other wildfowl, although it may be that these other and smaller species seek its company to profit by its extraordinary vigilance. Sandworms, crustaceans, and mollusks form its principal food whilst living on the coast, but in summer, at its breeding grounds, Worms, grubs, insects, ground fruits and berries are eaten. The European form of the curlew is pretty generally distributed over the western half of the Palearctic region, and in winter is found throughout Africa. The curlew begins to leave the coast for more or less inland haunts in March, scattering over most of our swampy moorlands and roughly higher grounds to breed. The eggs are laid during April and May. The nest is invariably made upon the ground, and consists merely of a shallow cavity, lined with a few bits of withered herbage or dead leaves. Numbers of pairs often nest within a comparatively small area of suitable ground, and should one pair be disturbed, the entire community is soon thrown into a state of alarm. The four eggs of the curly vary from olive green to buff, blotched and spotted with olive brown and pale grey. The curly begins to wander coastwards as soon as the young are reared. By far the majority seen first are young birds, and these arrive from the middle of July onwards. Wimbrel. This species, which is the Nemenius phleopus of Systemesis, is best known on British coast during its annual migrations, passing our islands so regularly that it has received the name of Maybird. On the Lincolnshire coast, as well as in many other districts, the Wimbrel is almost universally known as the Jack Curlew. During its seasonal movements it visits most part of the British coastline, but mudflats, salt marshes, estuaries and extensive reaches of sand are the most favoured localities. Its habits are very similar to those of the curlew, a bird which it somewhat closely resembles in general appearance, although it is much smaller. It is also a less wary bird, especially upon its arrival. Much stalking, however, soon teaches its shyness. Perhaps the wimbrel is not so often seen on the actual beach as the curlew. It seems to prefer to resort to slob-lands and swampy meadows adjoining the beach. It not only wades, but is said even to swim occasionally, and is fond of bathing, throwing the water over itself as it stands breast-high in the sea. In autumn and winter the wimbrel is certainly gregarious, but its gatherings are never so large on our coasts as those of the curlew. 
this however is entirely due to local causes for gatke reports that on the bright warm days of april and may they pass over heligoland in successive flocks at a vast height and flying at a tremendous speed on migration the note of the wimbrel may be described as a shrill he 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 its food during its yawn in small numbers on the british coasts consists principally of crustaceans sandworms and mollusks the wimbrel is a later breeder than the curlew during the nesting season it is one of the most local of our birds and is only known to nest on north rone one of the hebrides the orkneys and the shetlands its favourite breeding grounds are the wild moors at no great distance from the sea although not gregarious during summer many pairs often nest on the same portion of the moors the nest is made upon the ground sometimes amongst heather or beneath the shelter of a tuft of grass and consists of a few bits of withered herbage arranged carelessly in some slight hollow the four eggs are very like those of the curlew but are much smaller the bird's actions at the nest are very similar to those of the preceding species outside the british limits the breeding range of the typical wimbrel reaches from iceland and the faroes across arctic europe whilst its winter home is in africa godwits these birds rank amongst the rarest and most local of the british species of limicoline so that little more than a passing allusion to them is necessary in a work of the present character one of them the black-tailed godwit limosa melanora formerly known as the yarwhelp or barker used to breed regularly in some of the eastern counties of england but for nearly fifty years now it has not been known to do so the reclamation of its fenland haunts and the practice of netting it during the breeding season have probably been the chief causes of its extirpation a few birds still continue to appear on our coast especially on the vast mud flats and salt marshes of east anglia during their annual migrations and a few remain to winter outside our limits it nests in iceland and the faroes and in scandinavia but its chief breeding area extends across europe from holland to the south of russia in winter it draws southwards visiting the mediterranean basin and parts of africa the black-tailed godwit appears on the british coast on passage during april and may the return journey beginning in august and lasting for about a month in its habits it is very like the curlew picking up its food on the muds and marshes walking deliberately to and fro wading through the shallows and sometimes standing in the water breast high to sleep whilst on actual migration it is a restless bird continually shifting its ground but later in the year it becomes more settled and will visit certain spots to feed with great regularity its food whilst on our coasts consists of insects especially beetles worms crustaceans and mollusks its call note is a loud and shrill tee it this godwit breeds in may making a slight nest on the ground concealed amongst herbage in which it lays four piriform eggs olive brown spotted with darker brown and grey the second and smaller species the bar-tailed godwit limora rufa is certainly the best known and by far the most abundant so far as my observations extend this godwit occurs in greatest numbers on the mud flats and salt marshes of the wash where it is known in some places as a scamel there it is often taken in the flight nets and it is a well-known bird to the gunners of the coast this godwit passes along the british seaboard toward the end of april and early in may returning from the end of august up to the first week in november according to professor newton the twelfth of may is known as godwit day on the south coast of england because about that date large flocks of this bird arrive thereon on their passage north whilst with us its habits are much the same as those of the preceding species it is gregarious throughout the winter and often associates with other shore haunting birds both these godwits are readily distinguished from other limicoline species on the british coasts by their long and recurved bills they also present much diversity between summer and winter plumage the most marked difference is seen in the colour of the underparts which the present species changes from white in winter to rich chestnut in summer whilst in the black-tailed godwit the chestnut characteristic of the breeding season is confined to the neck and breast it is only in summer plumage that the tail of the bar-tailed godwit is barred in winter it is uniform ash-brown upon its first arrival on our shores the bar-tailed godwit is often remarkably tame admitting a close approach it is very fond of frequenting the creeks and dikes that intersect the salt marshes and muds and during high water often goes inland a little way to wait for the ebb 
the food of this godwit consists of worms crustaceans mollusks and similar marine creatures the note resembles the syllable kira kira kia often very persistently repeated as the birds fly up and down the coast in its quest for food it frequently wades but never swims nor dives unless wounded but little is known respecting the nidification of the bar-tailed godwit and its eggs very rare in collections have hitherto only been obtained in lapland these so closely resemble those of the preceding species that no known point of distinction can be given redshank during the greater part of the year this species the tonatus calidris of modern naturalists resides upon the coasts retiring to more or less inland districts to breed there are few prettier and more graceful birds along the shore than the red shank distinguished by its long orange-red legs and white lower back rump and secondaries the latter marbled with brown at the base in the breeding season the greyish brown upper plumage and the white breast characteristic of winter are mottled with rich dark brown in autumn our resident red shanks are largely increased in numbers by migratory individuals from more northerly latitudes many of these pass on to winter quarters further south but many others remain with us for the winter sociable at all times and frequently consorting with other limicoline species on the coast at winter especially the red shank becomes very gregarious its favourite haunts are mud flats and salt marshes and it is here that the largest flocks congregate but many odd birds frequent coasts of a more rocky character red shanks are sprightly restless birds almost constantly in motion when on the feed and scattering far and wide running to and fro with dainty action wading through the little pools and even occasionally swimming the shallows between one mud bank and another they are ever alert and take wing as soon as danger threatens the scattered flock soon forming into a compact mass again between the tides red shanks often collect on some mud bank where in a serried throng they keep up a confused babble of subdued cries as if all were talking and none listening its flight is rapid and most unsteady looking the black and white wings producing an idea of irregularity which is more imaginary than real upon the coast the red shank feeds on sandworms crustaceans mollusks and such like marine creatures but during summer at its breeding grounds worms insects ground fruits and berries are among the substances sought the call cool note of this wader is a loud shrill tew tew most persistently repeated when the bird is excited or alarmed whilst during the pairing season the love song or trill is happily described by professor newton who has had exceptional opportunities for observing the species as a constantly repeated liru 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 accompanied by many gesticulations as he hovers in attendance on the flight of his mate or with a slight change to a different key engages with a rival or again half angrily and half piteously complains of a human intruder on his chosen ground the red shank breeds somewhat locally in the marshy districts of our islands perhaps most commonly in the low-lying eastern counties of england and in scotland it is one of the earliest waders to quit the coast in spring and to retire to its nesting places which are fen and marshlands, swampy moors, and the boggy shores of lochs and tarns. Numbers of nests may be found within a small area of suitable ground, and certain spots appear to be visited annually for breeding purposes, in some cases even after the district, by reclamation, has lost its original marshy character. The nest is slight, but usually well concealed, often beneath the shade of a tuft of grass or other herbage, or in a hassock of sedge, or under a little bush or tall weed it consists of a mere hollow scantily lined with a few bits of withered grass or leaves the four eggs are very piriform in shape and vary from pale buff to dark buff handsomely and boldly blotched and spotted with rich dark brown paler brown and grey when disturbed the old birds become very noisy and excited careening wildly to and fro and should the young be hatched they become even more demonstrative and by various antics seek to decoy an intruder away a return to the coast is made as soon as the young are sufficiently matured many eggs of this bird are gathered and sold as plover's eggs sanderling during the period of its spring and autumn migrations especially the latter this pretty little bird the tringa arenaria of ornithologists who ignore the genus calidris named first by curvier in eighteen hundred and formerly founded eleven years later by illiger established as it is on such trivial character all things considered as the absence of a minute and functionless hind toe 
is one of the commonest and most widely distributed of limicoline birds comparatively few individuals remain on our coast to winter and these collect more especially on the southern beaches in winter plumage the dress in which it is most familiar to british observers the sanderling is a delicate silver grey above and pure white below but in the breeding season although the underparts remain unchanged in colour the upper parts become mottled with chestnut and black comparatively few sanderlings reach the british coasts before august and the southward migration continues during september by the middle of the latter month the bulk of the individuals has passed beyond our limits by the end of october but few remain although some of these prolong their stay over the winter the return migration begins in april and lasts over may into june there can be little doubt that the sanderlings migrate by night few birds are more trustful and engaging than this pretty little arctic stranger it not only frequents the long reaches of sand but mud flats estuaries and the creeks and streams and salt marshes its favourite haunts however are the sands during its sojourn on our coasts it consorts in flocks of varying size and very frequently a small party attach themselves to a larger gathering of dunlins or ringed plovers indeed for the society of the latter birds the sanderling shows a strongly marked preference we may safely say that during the migration period most large branches of ringed plovers contain a varying number of sanderlings its actions on the sand are very similar to those of the ringed plover but it does not appear ever to run in such fits and starts searching the ground more systematically after the manner of the stint or a dunlin during high water the sanderling very often resorts to the higher shingle and skulks amongst the pebbles sometimes remaining unseen until nearly trodden upon so closely does its white and grey dress resemble the stones among which it nestles upon the dark muds and the wet shining brown sand it is much more conspicuous and there are few prettier sights along the shore than a scattered flock of sanderlings standing head towards the observer looking like so many white balls of animated snow it searches for its food by running to and fro about the beach often on the very margin of the spent waves sometimes wading through the shallows or quickly dodging the foam-flecked in driving surf its food consists of sandworms crustaceans various insects and great quantities of small mollusks in summer however it is almost exclusively insectivorous but also feeds on the buds of the arctic saxifrages the note of this bird during its sojourn on our coast is a shrill wit but this is not very frequently or persistently uttered during winter the sandling is a great wanderer visiting parts of africa southern asia australia and south america but in the breeding season its range seems confined to the arctic region but very little is known of the nesting habits of the sandling and few of its eggs are in collections it is said to arrive at its arctic haunts in may or early june as soon as the water is free from ice and the ground bare of snow its nesting haunts are the barren grounds and tundras near and the beaches of the arctic ocean the nest is a mere hollow scantily lined with dry grass and leaves and the four eggs are buffish olive in ground colour mottled and spotted with pale olive brown and grey not this species the tringa canatus of linnaeus and most modern ornithologists is another of the arctic migrants that pass the british coasts regularly on their journeys and linger here in much smaller numbers over the winter camden in 1607 appears to have been the first author to connect the name of the knot with king canute but much difference of opinion exists as to the reason thereof some authorities assert that it was in connection with the story of that king upon the seashore others and perhaps with greater reason because of the royal dane's great liking for its flesh the bird continued to be so closely associated with the king by successive writers that linnaeus followed them in applying the specific name of canutus to the knot which is still retained by the majority of naturalists some migrations of the knot are very marked and regular the bird begins to arrive on the british coasts early in august and from then to the end of october a nearly constant stream pours upon them reaching its greatest volume in september by far the greater number pass on to still more southern haunts but a sufficiently large portion remain to winter as to render the species one of the most familiar of limicoline forms to habit choose of the coast the return migration begins on our coast in april and continues throughout may the principal haunts of the knot in the british islands are situated on the eastern and south-eastern coasts 
mud flats and salt marshes wide expansive sands and big estuaries are the spots where knots most do congregate for these furnish it with a constant supply of food ten years ago i remember great numbers of knots used to be caught in the flight nets on the wash during october and november but the numbers of late years have considerably decreased the knot is not only very gregarious but social and often mixes with companies of other waders when feeding knots keep close together generally all heading in the same direction and moving about quickly if the flock is a very large one some of the individuals are almost constantly in the air flying over the heads of their companions and alighting again as if eager to get the first look over the ground they are very wary when congregated in such large assemblies easily flushed and often performing various evolutions both over the sands or the water before alighting again the knot more often runs with a series of short quick steps than walks and it flies both rapidly and well after feeding the entire flock will often stand for a long time on a certain piece of the shore steeping and preening plumage but even on these occasions they are somewhat restless and it is rare to see all still at once they feed both by night and by day the call note is seldom or never uttered although when on migration the birds appear to be noisy enough crying incessantly to each other as they fly along in the gloom but little is known of the nesting economy of the knot its great breeding grounds the nesting places of the vast flocks that pass southwards in autumn still remain undiscovered where they are situated it is useless to speculate naturalists are ignorant of its eggs which still remain unknown in collections although the young in down have been obtained the knot breeds in the high arctic regions in the north polar basin mostly if not entirely above latitude eighty degrees and here it has been met with during summer by various travellers the knot is another bird remarkable for the great seasonal changes which its plumage undergoes in winter the plumage is ash grey above white below in summer the feathers of the upper parts become black margined with reddish brown and mixed with white those of the lower parts rich bay or chestnut it has been remarked that the birds that winter on our coast do not assume such rich tints in summer as individuals that pass along our coasts from more southern latitudes this is probably because the birds wintering with us are younger individuals only the elders penetrating to the remoter winter home the knot has a wide distribution during winter including the southern states and mexico africa and it is said australia and new zealand it is possible that in the latter countries the eastern knot the tringa crassirostris of science is confused with the present species curlew sandpiper this pretty little species known to many as the pygmy curlew and to modern naturalists by the scientific name of tringa subarquata is one of the rarest of the british limicoline it very closely resembles the knot in the colour of its plumage and in the seasonal changes that plumage undergoes but it is not much more than three-quarters the size and has a curved curly-like bill this little sandpiper like most of its order is a migrant breeding in some yet undiscovered part of the arctic regions retiring southwards to winter in africa various parts of southern asia and in australia it is during these journeys between the arctic regions and the tropics that it occurs on the british coasts a few individuals even remaining upon them all the winter through as might naturally be expected it is most frequently observed on the vast stretches of low coast on the eastern side of england it is also a tolerably frequent visitor to the south coast even as far westwards as devon and cornwall a few curly sandpipers arrive on our coasts in april but the greater number pass along them in may stragglers lingering until june the return flight is noticed in august and consists mostly of young birds the older ones reaching us during september and october the habits of this sandpiper very closely resemble those of the dunlin in whose company the bird is very frequently found and from which it may readily be distinguished even at a distance by its pure white upper tail coverts it prefers coasts of a muddy rather than sandy character haunting saltings estuaries and muds here its actions are much the same as those of all little sand birds it feeds both by day and night and often retires during high water to some wet land near the sea to wait the ebb the food of this species consists of crustaceans worms mollusks and insects its note is ascribed as being louder than that of the dunlin absolutely nothing is known of the nidification of the curly sandpiper and its egg has never yet been described it is to say the least remarkable that some of the great breeding places of these arctic birds have not yet been discovered a fact that seems to suggest a vast area of land somewhere in the vicinity of the pole 
Dunlin. Owing to the great seasonal changes of plumage which this sandpiper, the Tringa alpina of most naturalists, undergoes, considerable confusion has prevailed concerning it. Linnaeus described birds of this species in summer plumage as distinct from individuals in winter plumage, naming them Alpina and Pinclus, but Temenic, and before him B. Mayer, with greater discernment, united both under the name T. variabilis. Birds in the two plumages have also received distinctive colloquial names. In summer dress, the bird is known as Dunlin, in winter dress as the Pure. Other local names of wide application to this species are Oxbird, Stint, and Plover's Page, the latter being derived from the habit of the Dunlin to accompany a golden plover, flying to and fro over the moors, where the two species chance to be nesting. Perhaps the Rhinec has, in like manner, gained the name of Cuckoo's Mate, from its habit of flying in attendance with that bird, although some writers attribute the term to the fact of the two species appearing in our country about the same time. The Dunlin is absolutely the commonest limicoline bird of the shore, and certainly the most widely dispersed. It possesses the habit, in common with so many other species of this order, of retiring to moors to breed, but as soon as nesting duties are done it returns to the coast, and for the remainder of the year continues to reside upon it. The Dunlins that breed in our islands represent but a very small portion of the vast number that winter on the British coasts. The majority of these are from more northern haunts, winter migrants, that haste away again with the return of spring. During its residence on the coast, the Dunlin is remarkably gregarious, assembling often in flocks of thousands, which, by preference, seek such portions of the shore as are low-lying and muddy. Salt marshes, slob lands, estuaries and creeks, and vast expanses of mud, as the Wash, for instance, are the favourite haunts of the Dunlin. These large flocks of Dunlin are much more difficult to approach than smaller gatherings or individual birds. Dunlins are active little birds, almost incessantly in motion, running daintily about the muds, by the margin of the waves, or wading through the shallow tide pools. During the course of feeding, a large flock will become widely scattered, and it is remarkable how quickly the broken ranks reform. There are few sights so pretty along the salt marshes and mud flats than a large flock of Dunlins, in the act of performing those graceful aerial movements so characteristic of this little bird during its winter sojourn upon the coast the whole flock as with a single impulse will spread out like a net close up again apparently vanish appear black or like a flash of silver just as the birds turn and expose their dark or white plumage to the light sometimes the flock will head straight away down the coast passing the observer with a rush and whir of wings and a chorus of purring cries at other times, a large flock will rise en masse from the muds, pass out to sea a little way, turn, and go some distance along the shore, come back again, repeating the movement time after time, ever and anon appearing as though about to alight, dipping and rising with marvellous regularity. No doubt these movements will recall to the observer the gyrations of the autumn flocks of starlings, for there is much in common between the two. During its sojourn upon the coast, the Dunlin feeds upon crustaceans, sandworms, mollusks, and other small marine organisms, but in summer insects, grubs, worms, and ground fruits are eaten. The usual note of the Dunlin is harsh and resembles the word purr, hence one of the bird's trivial names. During the breeding season it is a long drawn pease. In the pairing season, when the male indulged in certain aerial gambols, he utters a trill which has been likened by some observers to the continuous ringing of a small bell. It is a rather remarkable fact that the Dunlin is the only species of Tringa that nests in the British islands. It breeds sparingly and locally in Cornwall, Devon, and Somerset, perhaps in Wales, and thence northwards, more generally, over the remainder of England, and in Scotland up to the Shetlands. Dunlins begin to move from the coasts in March and April, and to resort to their breeding places, which are situated in the marshy moorlands and mounty swamps, often at no great distance from the sea, or at least from tidal waters. The nest is a mere depression, often in a tussock of grass or rushes, or beneath a small bush, or even in a patch of thrift on bare sandy soil, lined with a few scraps of withered vegetation, or enclosed with a few twigs or roots. The four piriform eggs are pale olive or pale brown, blotched and spotted with reddish and blackish brown and grey. We remark the same extraordinary difference between summer and winter plumage, as we have already observed in the knot and some others. In summer or breeding plumage, the Dunlin is a rich reddish brown above, striped with dark brown, lower breast or gorget, deep black, 
remainder of upper parts white in winter the upper parts are chiefly ash grey and the under parts white except the gorget which is now greyish brown outside the british islands the dunlin has a very wide distribution breeding not only in the arctic regions of both hemispheres but in many temperate latitudes of the same in winter it is dispersed over north africa southern asia the southern states of america and the west indies at Heligoland, flocks of dunlins invariably indicate bad weather purple sandpiper this species the tringa maritima of brunnich and most modern naturalists but erroneously identified with the t striata of linnaeus by certain recent writers on ornithology is a fairly common and widely distributed bird on the british coast during autumn and winter the fact that a few odd birds are sometimes met with on our shores during the summer has led to the supposition totally unsubstantiated as yet that the purple sandpiper may breed here during some years this species is much more abundant than others a fact perhaps due to exceptionally favourable breeding seasons the purple sandpiper readily distinguished from all other british dimica line by its nearly black rump and upper tail coverts the purple gloss of its upper plumage and its yellow legs makes its appearance with us early in september and continues to arrive in increasing numbers during that month in october and leaves us by the following may this sandpiper is most partial to a rocky coast where the huge boulders shelve down into the water and large masses of rock and shingle are exposed at low tide it may however be frequently observed in the company of knots dunlins and ringed plovers on the mud-flats and sandy reaches she usually seeks for its food close to the water running over the rocks as a great wave breaks and retires even darting into the seething drifts of surf or coursing along the very edge of the rollers where each one threatens to annihilate it as it breaks upon the shore occasionally it may be seen to swim just outside the surf and when flushed it sometimes even alights upon the sea its food consists of crustaceans sandworms mollusks and insects and during summer of seeds as well although most of this food is obtained whilst the tide is driving in the bird may be seen in quest of it at the ebb it frequently retires inland a little way or rests upon a rocky islet or point between the ebb and the flow of the tide its flight is rapid and straightforward and often accompanied by its shrill and quickly uttered tee-wit the purple sandpiper though social is never seen on our coasts in very large flocks and perhaps most frequently in pairs or alone in norway however colette states that it assembles in countless flocks during the winter it is certainly one of the least shy of the limica line and often permits of a close approach especially when alone the best known breeding place of the purple sandpiper and one of its most southerly summer stations is on the faroes other breeding places are in iceland in norway spitsbergen and nova zembla and on various parts of the north siberian coasts and in arctic america to greenland it arrives at its nesting grounds in may or june these are rarely situated far from the sea although in the faroes it retires to the fells where it begins to nest even before the snow has all melted the nest is but a shallow depression scantily lined with scraps of withered vegetation and is made either close to the beach on broken ground covered with a sparse vegetation or in some marshy spot on a hill in the vicinity of the ocean the purple sandpiper may pair for life as there is some evidence to show that it returns annually to certain spots to breed the four eggs are pale olive or buffish brown beautifully blotched and spotted mottled and streaked with blackish and reddish brown and grey the sitting bird lingers long upon her nest sometimes remaining till almost trodden upon before she starts up and by feigning lameness seeks to draw the intruder away so closely is the purple sandpiper attached to the coast that even during the nesting season when its duties call it more or less inland it always visits the shore to feed in summer plumage the upper parts are marked with a rich chestnut and in winter dress the under parts are more spotted there are certain other limicoline birds found upon our coasts more or less frequently which at least deserve some passing notice but as they are species that are merely fleeting visitors during their annual migrations and never occur in sufficient number to form a dominant feature in the bird life of the shore they do not call for any lengthened description or minute study in a work which seeks only to sketch the more enduring avine characteristics of the british seaboard we will deal with the commonest species first during the period of its migrations the common sandpiper or summer snipe totanus hypoleucus is a pretty frequent visitor to the coast especially in the south-western parts of england and there is strong reason to believe that a limited number may pass the winter thereon 
its habits on the shore are very similar to those of other limicoline species it breeds commonly by the side of our inland waters and is certainly as its name implies the most abundant and the most widely dispersed of the british waders another fairly regular and frequent visitor to the british littoral in spring and autumn is the green shank totanus glottis it is most often met with on the low-lying eastern coasts but it is said a few birds winter in ireland the green shank breeds very locally in scotland and is best known to us at its more or less inland nesting stations it may be distinguished by its white lower back and central upper tail coverts and nearly uniform grey secondaries of even rarer and more local appearance is the wood sandpiper totanus gleriola sometimes met with in small parties on our eastern and southern coasts whilst the green sandpiper totanus ocropus is a less frequent visitor still this species is remarkable for its peculiar mode of nesting for instead of laying eggs upon the ground as is the almost universal custom of birds of this order it places them in the deserted nests of other birds and trees we must also not forget to give a passing reference to the singular-looking rough machetes pugnats drainage of the fens has long banished the rough from its ancestral haunts where it was once so common that a regular trade was carried on in the netting and fattening it for the table the rough takes its name from the singular yet remarkably beautiful frill of elongated feathers that during the love season adorns the neck of the male bird the extraordinary variation in the colour of this fleeting sexual ornament can only be described as marvellous it being almost impossible to find two birds exactly alike the sexual development of the feather ornament seems closely associated with the polygamous habits of the ruff the cock bird takes no share in family duties and during the pairing season wages endless battles with his rivals for the possession of the hens odd birds frequent our coasts during the migration periods and less frequently during the winter two species of stint the most diminutive of the sandpipers also deserve a brief allusion the first and most frequent visitor is the little stint tringa minuta most numerous on its autumn passage south it is chiefly seen on the eastern coastline but is a visitor to the solway district the little stint breeds in the arctic regions of europe and west siberia and is a late migrant in spring seldom seen in any numbers on our coast before may it frequents whilst with us mud flats salt marshes and long reaches of sand and often joins the dunlins in quest of food its stay with us is brief especially in spring and even in autumn most have gone away before october it may be distinguished by its small size wing under four inches in length tapering bill and black legs and feet the second species temenic stint tringa temenici is a larger bird than the foregoing and readily distinguished from all other tringa by its white outer tail feathers it is much rarer in its appearance too and as usual most frequent on the low-lying eastern coastline even this district is beyond the more general limits of its migrations it is also not so maritime in its haunts and seems to migrate along more inland routes end of section four section five of british seabirds by charles dixon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three guillemots razorbill and puffin few birds are more thoroughly marine in their haunts and their habits than those which are included in the present chapter they are inseparably associated with the sea they form one of the most interesting features of marine life whether in summer when they crowd in countless hosts at their breeding stations upon the cliffs and islands or in winter when they spread themselves far and wide over the waste of waters from whatever point of view we study them they are intensely interesting birds the auks as they are collectively termed form the small yet well-defined family alcidae although the auks are a specialized group systematists pretty generally agree in associating them more or less closely with the divers the grebes the gulls and the limicoli auks are web-footed birds with no hind toe with the legs placed far back and the bills subject to great variation in size and in some species presenting considerable change in appearance according to season all the auks have comparatively short and narrow wings in the recently extinct great auk these were incapable of supporting the bird in the air and the tail is remarkably short in some species being scarcely perceptible under ordinary circumstances the auks are exclusively confined to the north temperate and polar regions of the northern hemisphere 
and by far the greater number of species inhabit the northern Pacific. They number some thirty species. The prevailing colours of the Orcs are black and white. None of them are showy birds. But some species are remarkable for their eccentric nuptial plumes, and for the brilliancy of colour of the bill. The Orcs are thoroughly aquatic, and not adapted in any way for a terrestrial existence. They swim well, dive with marvellous skill, and save during the incubation period, pass most of their time on the sea. None of the species are remarkable for any great migration flights. As a rule, they wander little from their high northern homes. They are all gregarious birds, breeding in companies whenever possible. Some species undergo but little change in their appearance between summer or winter plumage. Others are more remarkable in this respect. During the breeding period, some species resort to lofty cliffs washed by the sea. Others burrow into the ground. Many species make no nest whatever, but others form slight structures in which to deposit their eggs. The young of the orcs are hatched covered with down, assuming their first plumage in a few weeks. Adult orcs moult in September, the difference in the colour of the plumage peculiar to the pairing season, apparently being entirely due to a change in the hue quite irrespective of a moult. The complete change from white to brownish black observed prior to the breeding season on the necks and heads of guillemots and razorbills is very curious and interesting. According to the observations of Herr Gatke, the shafts of the feathers are the first portions in which the black appears, yet almost at the same time this colour is seen in the form of minute specks on the lower third of the feathers, quickly spreading into crescentic markings, and ultimately covering the entire surface. Half of a dozen species are British. Of these, four breed more or less abundantly in our area, and the other two are regular winter visitors. The now extinct Great Auk, the largest known representative of the family, formerly bred in certain parts of the British Islands, but, alas, is now only known as a fast receding tradition. We will now proceed to a short study of these British Auks. Guillemot Of all the various seabirds that cluster on the cliffs of Albion, this species, the Uria Troll, of most modern ornithologists, is by far the commonest, and of the present family of birds the most widely distributed. During summer it may be met with in colonies of varying numbers, here and there on most of our rocky coasts, from the Scilly Islands to the Shetlands, from Flamborough Head in the east to the Blaskets in the west. Not perhaps so familiar to the seaside wanderer as the gull, whose aerial habits bring it more frequently into notice, the guillemot nevertheless is a seldom absent feature of marine bird life. It is gregarious and social at all times, but joins into greatest companies during the season of reproduction. When the nesting season has passed, the birds spread themselves more generally along the coast and out at sea, and it is at such times that they are most ubiquitous. Between October and March, the guillemot may often be met with swimming close in shore, in quiet bays, and especially in the neighbourhood of fishing villages. On these occasions, it is not particularly shy, and will allow a sufficiently close scrutiny, but it is ever wary, diving at the least alarm, and appearing again well out of danger. The guillemot swims well and buoyantly, but also dives with remarkable agility, and obtains most of its food whilst doing so. The guillemots are rarely seen upon the land after the young have quitted their birthplaces. They spend their entire time upon the sea, seeking shelter during rough weather in bays and under the lee of headlands, but not unfrequently great numbers perish in a gale, their dead bodies strewing the coast where the tide has cast them ashore. Except during the breeding season, the guillemot flies very little, but during that period it often feeds far from its rocky haunts, and may then be seen, especially at eventide, flying in little bunches or in compact flocks, swiftly and silently just above the waves, returning to them. The food of this bird is almost exclusively composed of fish, especially such small species as pilchards and sprats is also extremely partial to the fry of the herring and the pollock. Few birds are more expert at catching fish than the guillemot. It dives after them, and chases them beneath the surface with marvellous speed and unerring certainty. In this chase of fish it sometimes comes to grief by getting entangled in the drift nets. The guillemot is a remarkably silent bird. I have repeatedly been amongst thousands of these birds, both at sea and on the rock stacks where they breed, and the only sound I have ever heard them utter is a low grunting noise. My experience has been chiefly confined to the earlier part of the breeding season, and the autumn and winter months. It would appear, though, that when the young are partly grown, the birds become more noisy, or Gatke describes their cries at the breeding stations, confused noise of a thousand voices, 
the calls of the parent birds r r r or r r r r r and mingled with these the countless tiny voices of their young offspring on the face of the cliff ir er er id ir er 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 id uttered in timid and anxious accents i should here remark that the guillemot never flies over the land never flies inland from the rocks but always when disturbed unerringly makes for the sea which is almost if not quite as much its element as the air the actions of the guillemot are interesting enough upon the sea few sights being prettier than a number of these birds busily engaged in capturing their finny food but the most attractive scenes in the life of this bird are to be witnessed at its breeding places formerly these were much more numerous than is now the case especially in england but there on the southern coast lie notably so many a large colony has disappeared for ever and many another has been sadly reduced in numbers the distribution of the guillemot becomes much more local during summer the birds crowding in vast numbers to certain time-honoured spots fortunately some of these still remain fairly accessible to the lover of birds one of the most famous breeding stations is at the farne islands another on the cliffs of bempton whilst less noted places are the Isle of Wight, the Scilly Islands, and the coasts of Devon and Cornwall. The great number of local names by which the guillemot is known round our coast speaks to its former abundance, Lavi, Marrock, Mir, Diver, and Willock, the latter applicable to the young, may be mentioned as a few of the best known. The birds congregate at their old accustom haunts in spring, with remarkable regularity, often punctually arriving on the same day for years in succession at heligoland and certainly other places guillemots return to their nesting places from time to time during the winter appearing in the morning for a little while just as rooks are wont to do at nest trees the guillemot rears its young on the face of the lofty ocean cliffs or on the flat tops of rock stacks cliffs with plenty of ledges and hollows are preferred and in such chosen spots the birds crowd so closely that at some stations the wonder is how each individual can possibly find room to incubate its egg or even secure a standing place in the general throng there can be little doubt that in such crowded spots as the pinnacles many of the eggs never reach maturity the guillemot makes no nest of any kind but lays its single large pear-shaped egg on any suitable ledge or in any available hollow where it can be tolerably safe from toppling over into the sea there are few more stirring sights in the bird world than a large colony of guillemots i still retain the vivid impressions made upon my mind by the vast hordes of these birds at st kilda at the farne islands and elsewhere even whilst i write i can once more see the struggling quarrelling rowdy hosts of guillemots that crowd the famous pinnacles still see them pouring off in endless streams headlong into the water as i prepare to scale their haunt once more memory recalls and paints in vivid scene the beetling st kilden cliffs with their rows and rows of white-breasted guillemots sitting tier upon tier upwards and upwards towards the dark blue sky my tiny boat tossing like a cork on the wild atlantic swell and the countless swarms of guillemots swimming in the sea around me hastening to the cliffs or returning from them beaten off by more fortunate possessors of a place the guillemot lays a single egg without making a nest of any kind for its reception if this egg be taken however the bird will lay a second or a third and advantage is taken of this fact by those persons that gather them for a livelihood the egg of no other known bird varies to such an extraordinary extent as that of the guillemot whilst few if any are more beautiful greens browns yellows pale blues and white form the principal ground colour the markings which take the form of spots blotches streaks and zones are composed of browns greys and pinks of every possible tint one variety is white intricately laced netted and streaked with pink another is a beautiful green streaked in the same manner with yellow light brown or nearly black others of various ground colours are zoned with blotches or marked with fantastic shaped spots and rings some eggs of the guillemot closely resemble those of the razor bill but may be distinguished by the yellowish white interior of the shell when held up to the light there has been much controversy as to the way in which the guillemot chicks reach the water from their lofty birthplace some writers assert that the parent bird carries them down to the sea on its back on the other hand Gatke maintains that the chicks tumble off the ledges into the water, being enticed to do so by the old birds swimming on the sea beneath the cliffs. He writes, In its distress, the little chick tries to get as near as possible to the mother waiting for it below, and keeps tripping about on the outermost ledge of the rock, often with no more than a finger's breadth, until it ends by slipping off and turning two or three somersaults, 
lands with a faint splash on the surface of the water both parents at once take charge of it between them and swim off with it towards the open sea this is the only way in which i have seen this change of habit of the young birds accomplished during some fifty summers as soon as the young are sufficiently matured the sea in the vicinity of the breeding stations is deserted and the colonies disperse far and wide from this time forward to the following breeding season the guillemot's movements are to a certain extent unknown as professor newton justly asks what becomes of the millions of guillemots and other auks that breed in northern latitudes the birds that are met with around the coasts of temperate europe and elsewhere bear no proportion whatever to the mighty hosts whose position and movements remain unrevealed at present the only feasible explanation seems to be that the birds during the non-breeding season are scattered in quest of sustenance over many thousands of square miles of water in summer only is their vast abundance palpable when all are gathered into a comparatively small area the connection with the guillemot mention should be made of the ringed guillemot the uria ringia of latham it only differs from the common guillemot in having a narrow white band round the eye which is prolonged into a streak for some distance behind and below it it may be seen breeding in company with a commoner form and it is not known to differ in its habits whether it is a distinct species as gatke states or merely a variety of the common guillemot as many naturalists believe still remains to be decided brunnick's guillemot this guillemot the uria bruinicki of sabine and most modern writers is a very rare visitor to the british islands its home being in the arctic regions from greenland possibly to the lake off islands off the coasts of northern siberia it deserves a passing notice for it is possible that it occurs in british waters more frequently than is generally supposed it is a perceptibly stouter bird than the common guillemot and has the base of the upper mandible pale grey in its habits and economy it is not known to differ in any special manner from the better known species of which it is the arctic form black guillemot this species the dove key or greenland dove of northern mariners the tristi of the shetlanders and the area grilli of naturalists is by far the most local of the auks that are indigenous to the british islands during the breeding season it is only known to frequent one english locality the isle of man but in scotland it is pretty generally distributed along the western and northern coasts including st kilda the orkneys and the shetlands its chief resorts in ireland are on the north and west coasts the difference between the summer and winter plumage of this little bird is most extraordinary in spring it assumes a rich black dress glossed with green except a patch of white on the wings in winter it is uniformly mottled black and white the legs and feet are bright coral red with us the black guillemot is strictly marine in its haunts but in spitzbergen it was found breeding more than a mile inland a habit very different from any it displays with us in its actions it very closely resembles its larger allies like them it is an expert diver i have seen it dive repeatedly at the flash of a gun and thus escape the shot it is on the whole a more trustful bird often permitting a near approach and frequently remaining on the surface until the boat is about to pass over it when it will dive and reappear quite unconcernedly a short distance away out of danger this guillemot often feeds quite closely inshore at st kilda i used to see parties of this species every evening fishing under the cliffs but on the other hand i have often met with them searching for food many miles from land the black guillemot is nothing near so gregarious as the common guillemot nor does it appear to wander so far from its breeding places to feed it is partially nocturnal in its habits in summer feeding well into the dusk and during winter seldom comes upon the land sleeping out at sea although capable of flying swiftly it always prefers to escape danger by diving it swims lightly usually sitting high in the water but it has the power of sinking itself more than half below the surface when apparently alarmed black guillemots may often be seen in strings flying to and from a distant feeding place hurrying along close to the water their short wings beating rapidly and rendered very conspicuous by the broad white bar the food of this guillemot is largely composed of the fry of the herring and the coal fish but other small fishes are eaten as are crustaceans and various marine insects i have never heard the black guillemot utter a sound beyond a low grunting but its note has been described as a whining sound that of the young birds being more shrill in chasing its finny prey under the water the black guillemot displays astonishing powers darting to and fro aided by its wings and feet during winter these birds wander southwards and then they may sometimes be seen off our more frequented coasts 
black guillemot retires to its breeding stations in may these are situated in our islands on rocky headlands and islands and on ocean cliffs here its colonies are never very large and often much scattered it very probably pairs for life and resorts often to one particular spot year after year the bird deposits its eggs in a hole or cranny of the cliffs occasionally in the clefts amongst fallen rocks at the foot of a precipice or in a rock strewn down sloping to the sea it makes no nest and the eggs rest upon the bare ground or rock the black guillemot and its allies are remarkable for the fact that their eggs are two or three in number in all other members of the alcidae the eggs never exceed one this peculiarity has induced some systematists to restrict the genus uria to the black guillemots alone the black guillemot lays two eggs much smaller than and not so pear-shaped as those of the common guillemot cream buff or pale green in ground colour blotched and spotted with rich dark brown paler brown and grey the young chicks are said not to repair to the sea at so early an age as those of the preceding birds and to be soon deserted by their parents after doing so congregating in flocks by themselves razor bill this bird the alcatorda of linnaeus and ornithologists generally is widely confused with the common guillemot and many local names refer indiscriminately to each such as muir marrot and diver it is readily distinguished from the guillemots by its much deeper bill crossed by a white line at its centre and by a narrow yet very conspicuous white stripe extending from the base of the bill to the eye otherwise the razor bill closely resembles the guillemot in appearance both in its summer and winter plumage it is widely distributed round the british coasts breeding in most situations where the cliffs are sufficiently suitable but is much less abundant in the south and is nowhere perhaps so numerous as the guillemot during the non-breeding season it becomes more generally scattered and may then be met with although ever sparingly in the seas round most parts of the british coastline its actions in the water are almost precisely the same as those of the guillemot like that bird it may be seen swimming to and fro sitting highly and lightly on the water often permitting a very close approach especially in districts where it is not much harassed by the shooter it dives with the same marvellous celerity as the guillemot pursuing its prey through the water often at a considerable depth as readily as the swallows chase an insect through the air it is a very pretty sight to watch the razor bill in quest of food this may often be done from the summits of the cliffs but certainly to better advantage from a boat in which the birds can be more closely approached and consequently better observed a razor bill in the water is a remarkably striking if not an actually pretty bird he sits so lightly riding buoyantly as a cork on the swell turning his head from side to side as the boat approaches swimming rapidly before it and often nonchalantly dipping his head into the water and throwing a shower over his upper plumage the boat comes too near at last and the bird with a scarcely audible or perceptible splash disappears into the water several moments afterwards he rises again to the right or left ahead or astern and the salt spray rolls off his plumage glinting like diamonds in the sun should fish be plentiful the birds are diving and rising again incessantly the time of absence depending upon the depth descended or the length of the chase the razor bill ever seems to use its wings with reluctance on these occasions always keeping out of harm's way by diving or swimming it is capable of rapid flight through and may often be seen in strings or skeins hastening along just above the waves to or from a favourite fishing place the razor bill is gregarious enough during summer but in winter it is most frequently seen in small parties or often alone it also goes some distance from land where should a gale overtake it great numbers often perish as their dead bodies washed up on the coast sadly testify the food of the razor bill is largely composed of fry especially of the herring but many other small fishes are captured together with crustaceans and other small marine creatures the bird so far as my experience extends never seeks its food upon the shore and obtains most if not all of it by diving the razor bill is a remarkably silent bird the only sound i have ever heard it utter has been a low grunting this note is uttered both in summer and winter on the rocks as well as on the sea in may the razor bill gives up its roaming nomad life upon the sea and collects in numbers at the old accustomed breeding places these are situated on the ocean cliffs such as contain plenty of nooks and crannies being preferred to those of a more wall-like character 
it is possibly due to this that the razorbill's colonies are never so crowded as those of the guillemot and that the birds are more scattered along the coastline there can be little doubt that the razorbill pairs for life as a proof of this i have known a puffin burrow resorted to yearly whilst eggs possessing certain peculiarities of form and colour have repeatedly been taken from one nook in the cliffs years and years in succession like the guillemot the razorbill makes no nest but lays its single egg in a crevice or hole in the cliffs or far under stacks of rock poised one upon another where to reach it is an utter impossibility like most birds that breed in such situations the razorbill is much more loath to quit its egg than the guillemot often remaining upon it until captured when alarmed by man the birds may be heard scrambling amongst the crevices and uttering their grunting cries of remonstrance the single egg of the razorbill though not displaying a tithe of the variety observed in that of the guillemot is a remarkably handsome object the ground colour varies through every tint between white and reddish brown and the handsome large blotches and spots are dark liver brown reddish brown grey or greyish brown no shade of green or blue is ever apparent upon them externally but the shells when held up to the light have the interior of a clear pea-green tint a character which readily serves to distinguish them from such eggs of the guillemot that resemble them in external colour if the first egg be taken the bird will lay another and this process may be repeated several times but on no occasion is more than one chick reared in the season it is said that the young of this species remain upon the cliffs for a much longer period than the chicks of the guillemot and that they eventually fly or flutter down to the sea never visiting the rocks the parent will sometimes dive with its offspring just as the little reed will do little auk this species the roch of arctic navigators and the mergulus alle of ornithology is but an irregular visitor to british seas during autumn and winter and as it seldom comes near the land under ordinary circumstances it is not a very familiar bird to the seaside observer exceptionally severe weather not infrequently drives this little bird far inland in its general coloration the little auk closely resembles the razorbill but it is less than half the size and has a considerable amount of white on the wings this curious little species congregates in incredible numbers at certain spots in the arctic regions to breed beechy at the beginning of the present century records that he has seen nearly four millions of these birds on the wing at one time colonies of the little auk are known in nova zembla franz josef land spitzbergen grimsey island to the north of iceland and the coasts of greenland like all its larger allies the little auk is thoroughly pelagic in its habits apparently only visiting the land to breed living on the sea for the remainder of the year it is well adapted for its lengthened sojourn upon the waters it swims well and buoyantly sitting rather low flies rapidly when inclined dies with as much ease as a fish and sleeps quite safely and comfortably upon the waves voyagers in the arctic regions have met with flocks of little auks at most times of the year often far from land and occasionally crowding upon the masses of floating ice all observers agree in describing it as a somewhat noisy bird and its specific name of ali is said to resemble its ordinary note there is scarcely a winter that the little auk is not obtained in varying numbers off the british coasts more frequently of course in the northern districts but under ordinary circumstances it keeps too far off the land to be observed and occurs most plentifully during periods of continued storm where the uncounted millions of little auks winter that are known to breed in the arctic regions washed by the atlantic is still an unsolved problem the few that are observed are as nothing in comparison with the numbers that crowd at certain spots during summer perhaps it is because the area of distribution is so wide in winter and comparatively speaking so restricted during summer the food of the little auk consists largely of minute crustaceans and possibly of small fish the bird is said to resort to the vicinity of fishing fleets to pick up the refuse thrown overboard in may the little auk resorts to the land to breed it is eminently gregarious and some of its colonies consist of an almost incredible number of birds curiously enough its breeding places are not always by the sea some of them being situated a considerable distance from the coast sloping rock-covered banks at the foot of the cliffs seem to be preferred to the cliffs themselves a favourite situation is on the sloping ground below a range of cliffs where the surface is covered with stones and rock fragments that have during succeeding ages crumbled from the precipices towering above here in cavities worn by wind and storm 
beneath large stones and rock fragments or in various hollows and holes under the fallen debris the little auk deposits its single pale greenish-blue egg out of reach of the arctic foxes that prowl about the colony in quest of prey the actions of the little auk at its nesting colony seem to be very similar to those of the puffin when breeding on slopes as for instance on the island of dune one of the st kilda group puffin of all the auks of the present species the alca arctica of linnaeus and the fraticula arctica of modern ornithologists is not only the best known but the most readily distinguished the puffin cannot readily be mistaken for any bird along the coast his big brightly coloured beak and comical facial expression being never failing marks of his identity in the colour of its plumage the puffin somewhat closely resembles the guillemot or the little auk only the throat and the sides of the head are white the most striking feature in the puffin is its beak a deep laterally flattened coulter shaped organ banded with blue yellow and red singularly grooved and embossed with horny excrescences although these latter are only assumed for the pairing season and are cast again when the breeding period is over unlike most birds therefore the puffin displays his wedding ornaments on his beak and this singular peculiarity appears to be common to various other species more distantly allied yet undoubtedly of close affinity with the english puffin many local names have been applied to the puffin in consequence of its singular beak bottlenose coulter neb and sea parrot may be mentioned as the most commonly used like most if not all members of the auk family the puffin is not seen much near the land after the breeding season has passed indeed it is very doubtful whether the bird ever voluntarily seeks the coast after it leaves in the early autumn with its young continued gales and storms will occasionally drive a bird even far inland whilst rough weather often causes it to perish at sea its remains being sometimes washed up in quantities its actions on the water are almost precisely the same as those of the guillemot and razor bill it is an adapt swimmer a marvellous diver it flies well and strongly especially during the summer where i have seen it in swarms drifting round and round the highest peaks of its island haunt on apparently never tiring wing at the summit of the cliffs its powers of flight may often be witnessed to perfection at st kilda i have watched it gracefully poising itself in the air its narrow wings beating rapidly and its two orange-coloured legs spread out behind acting as a rudder of all the auk tribe so far as my experience goes the puffin flies the most the puffin feeds principally upon small fish especially sprats and the fry of larger fishes it also eats crustaceans and various marine insects it dives often to a great depth and is remarkably active beneath the surface when on the water it generally tries to escape from danger by diving sometimes the puffin may be seen close ashore during winter but never in any abundance the puffin becomes by far the most interesting at its breeding places the regularity of its appearance at these has often been remarked in many localities it not only arrives punctually on a certain day but retires from it in autumn with its young almost as regularly in some places puffins arrive on the land to breed as early as march in others not before april in others yet again not before the beginning of may with the exception of the south and east coast of england where it is only sparingly and locally distributed the puffin from flamborough northwards is widely and generally dispersed in some places its numbers are almost incredible as for instance at lundy island the farne islands on some of the hebrides and st kilda there is a very interesting colony of puffins established amongst the walls of the ancient fortress on the bass rock but so far as my experience goes the colony on st kilda stands unrivalled and at a very moderate computation must consist of many millions of birds the puffin most probably pairs for life and returns time out of mind to a certain familiar spots to rear its offspring in most places the bird makes its scanty nest in a burrow which it excavates itself but in some localities rabbit holes are frequently made use of in some localities however the bird makes a nest in a crevice of the cliffs or beneath heaps of rocks by the end of april both birds are engaged in scraping out this burrow if circumstances demand it which often extends for several yards in the loamy soil sometimes sloping downwards sometimes tortuous sometimes nearly straight at the end or elsewhere in some cases the slight nest of dry grass and a few feathers is formed occasionally several pairs occupy one burrow each pair enlarging a portion of it for their own requirements into a kind of chamber whilst many of the burrows have several openings are evidently a work of successive years in this rude nest the hen puffin lays a single egg dull white sometimes tinged with blue or grey 
and obscurely spotted with pale brown and grey contact with the earth in the burrow and with the wet feet of a sitting bird soon discolours this egg and renders it almost like a ball of peat in appearance when disturbed at their breeding places such puffins as may chance to be outside the hole soon fly off to the sea and join the hosts of birds that swarm in the water near every breeding station those in the burrows however remain allowing themselves to be dragged out without making any attempt to escape great caution and gloves are recommended for the puffin resents intrusion and bites fiercely being able to inflict a nasty cut with its powerful beak and sharp claws i still retain the most vivid impressions on my visit to the grand colony of puffins on dune one of the st kilda group every available place is honeycombed with their holes the ground cannot afford accommodation for all and numbers of birds have to seek nesting places under the masses of rock lying on the grass-covered hillsides or in the crannies of the cliff at the summit of the island as soon as we had fairly got ashore and begun to walk up the slopes the puffins in a dense whirling bewildering host swept downwards to the sea or rose high in air to circle above our heads in the direst alarm it seemed as if the whole face of the island were slipping away from under me just like flakes of shale down a quarry side not a single bird so far as i could ascertain uttered a note but the whirring noise of the millions of rapidly beating wings sounded like the distant rush of wind but even doom does not harbour so many puffins as find a home on the face of the mighty cliff Conacher and when we fired a gun and disturbed them from this noble precipice it seemed as though the face of the entire cliff was flying outwards into the atlantic the enormous clouds of birds overpowering one with its magnificence as soon as the young are reared the land is deserted and the wandering pelagic life resumes in connection with this species mention may be made of its former repute as an article of food old records inform us that the puffins were regularly gathered by the owners of the breeding places and were salted down for future food gesner and caius assert that the puffin was allowed to be eaten during lent probably because in the words of carew of its coming nearest to fish in taste more than two hundred years ago ligon in his history of barbados complains of the ill taste of puffins which he had received from the scilly islands once a great centre of exportation of these birds and asserts that this kind of food is only for servants the taste for salted and dried puffin however still lingers in the land for at st kilda vast numbers are caught and so preserved by the natives for food dried puffin perhaps a twelve months old is one of the few delicacies of the island whilst the feathers help materially to pay the rent End of section 5section six of british seabirds by charles dixon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four divers grebes and cormorants the birds included in the present chapter belong to three well-defined families none of them are so completely pelagic as the auks and yet according to season many of them are interesting features in the bird life of the coast unfortunately for the summer visitor to the seaside the divers will be absent they are birds that resort chiefly to inland districts to rear their young or are only known as winter visitors to the british coasts the divers form a small but well-marked family known as colymbidae consisting of a single genus columbus into which are grouped the four species that are now known to science the divers are allied to the auks on the one hand to the grebes on the other although systematists are not yet agreed upon the degree of their relationship united these three families form dr schlater's order pygopodes in every way the divers are remarkably well fitted for an aquatic life their strong tarsi are laterally compressed a form best suited for cleaving the water the hind toe is well developed and on the same plane as the rest the feet are webbed the bill is long straight spear-shaped and conical admirably adapted for seizing the finny prey the wings are comparatively short yet capable of bearing the bird at great speed the tail is short and fairly developed the divers in neutral plumage are remarkably handsome birds the neck being striped or richly marked and the upper plumage beautifully spotted or adorned with white bars they are all more or less gregarious birds during winter and well-marked social tendencies are displayed in some species during the breeding season their migrations if comparatively short are pronounced and regular the young are hatched covered with down able to swim with ease almost immediately 
adults molt in autumn and assume their neutral plumage in winter a period doubtless when they pair the winter plumage thus being carried for a short time young divers carry their first plumage through the winter until the following spring not molting in december with their parents when they assume their summer plumage but the neutral ornaments are not so brilliant in colour as in adults whether the vernal change in colour is effected without molting as in the yorks and some of the limiculae appears not to have yet been ascertained all the species of divers are visitors to the british islands but only two breed in them and one is an exceptionally irregular strangler this is the largest of them all the white-billed diver columbus adamici and a species apparently circumpolar in its distribution the divers are all birds of the north of temperate or arctic regions during summer in winter their range is much more extended almost reaching to the northern tropics with this brief resume of their more salient characteristics we will now proceed to a more detailed examination of their economy great northern diver this species the columbus glacialis of nilaeus and of ornithologists generally is in its breeding plumage one of the handsomest of british birds its chief characteristics are its large size about that of a goose black head and neck double semi collars of white and black vertical stripes and black upper parts marked with white spots of varying size and arranged in a series of belts whether it actually breeds within our limits has not yet been absolutely determined although evidence is forthcoming that seems to point to the fact unfortunately for the seaside student of bird life the great northern diver is only known as a winter visitor at that season however it may be met with pretty frequently off the british coasts the young birds especially venturing into our bays and creeks and estuaries older individuals as a rule keeping further out to sea adult birds are however often observed near the coasts of south devonshire and cornwall i have known them linger in the waters near here until the summer has been well advanced young birds of this species in the brown and white dress characteristic of immaturity may often be seen quietly fishing under the cliffs notably in tor bay one very remarkable thing about this diver is its singular habit of immersing the body to such a depth that the back is quite under water it often so sinks itself when menaced by danger and then almost out of sight swims away with great speed if pursuit is still continued all but the neck is sunk below the surface and finally if hotly pressed the bird will disappear entirely and swim along under water at a speed absolutely astonishing gatke reports that this diver when chased by a boat under these circumstances will dive and allow the boat to pass over it rising again in the rear of it a habit which my own observations of the bird completely confirm how this act of immersion without apparent effort is accomplished remains a mystery and offers a problem in animal mechanics by no means easy of solution the great northern diver is rarely seen on land perhaps never except during the breeding season its movements on shore are ungainly in the extreme the legs being placed so far back that the bird can only push itself along in a crawling sort of way it is equally rarely seen in the air and apparently only uses its wings to fly when performing its annual migrations how the species still retains the function of flight at all seems almost a mystery but perhaps the constant use of the wings in the water keeps them to a standard of efficiency this diver is one of the least gregarious and save on passage is rarely met with in numbers greater than a pair it seems to be the rule for odd pairs to take up their residence in certain spots during the breeding season after that period the bird is usually met with solitary and the young individuals unlike so many others that evince strong gregarious propensities for the most part wander about alone this diver like most big birds is shy and wary although i have repeatedly watched it from the cliffs in tor bay evincing little concern at my presence as may be gathered from the foregoing remarks the great northern diver is a proficient in the art of diving and is said to be able to remain as long as eight minutes beneath the surface a period of time which seems incredible the depth to which it sometimes descends is enormous it has been captured in a net thirty fathoms from the surface the food of this diver is almost if not absolutely composed of fish during the non-breeding season divers are not particularly noisy birds but at their nesting places the cries they utter are both loud and startling described by some listeners as similar to the screams of tortured children as shrieks of maddened laughter or as weird and melancholy howls by others 
it is a somewhat remarkable fact that the great northern diver breeds nowhere in europe except on iceland it is an american species and nests from greenland westwards to alaska south of the arctic circle to the more northern of the united states it reaches its breeding grounds in pairs toward the ends of may as soon as the northern waters are free from ice its favourite nesting places are secluded tarns and lakes and an island is always selected if possible doubtless from motives of security the nest always made upon the ground varies a good deal in size according to the local requirements on wet marshy ground it is large and composed of a heap of half-rotten sedges rushes reeds and such like vegetation lined with dry bits of broken reed and withered grass on drier and barer situations it is little more than a hollow in the sand or hard ground with perhaps a few bits of dry grass for lining the birds are very alert and watchful whilst nesting as if fully conscious of their comparative difficulty in escaping from danger on the land one bird is generally on the lookout whilst the other sits and at the least danger the alarm is given and the incubating partner shuffles off in a floundering way to the water a path is thus soon worn from the nest to the lake the eggs are almost invariably too elongated and varying in ground colour from russet brown to olive brown spotted sparingly with blackish brown and paler brown when the young are sufficiently matured the inland haunts are deserted and the nomad wandering life upon the sea resumed black-throated diver the present species of diver much smaller than the preceding the colymbus arcticus of linnaeus and most other writers is the rarest of the three that visit the british islands regularly and perhaps we might also say the most beautiful in neutral dress all its showy colours and patterns however are on the head neck and upper parts the under surface being white the head is grey the throat patch black above which is a semi collar of white striped vertically with black the sides of the neck are also striped with black and white whilst the black upper parts of the body are conspicuously marked with a regular series of neatly square white spots becoming oval in shape on the wing coverts the bill is black the irides crimson after the autumn moult all this finery is lost and the upper parts become a nearly uniform blackish brown this diver breeds sparingly in various parts of the hebrides and the highlands from argyll to caithness elsewhere it is only known as a winter visitor in many of its habits it closely resembles the preceding species it is exclusively aquatic only seeking the land during the breeding season but is perhaps not quite so oceanic as that bird in the winter when it not unfrequently haunts inland waters it dives with equal skill flies with the same powerful rapidity and utters during the nesting season very similar unearthly cries fish form the chief food of this diver but it is said also to capture frogs most of the examples of this diver are seen close inshore on our eastern and southern coast principally during winter are immature the older birds are as a rule keeping further out to sea the black-throated diver indulges in the same peculiar habit of gradually sinking its body in the sea when alarmed and will frequently seek to escape pursuit by diving outright and swimming under water for a considerable distance the black-throated diver that breeds with us retire to their inland haunts in may its favourite nesting places are on islands in moorland lochs pools and tarns it displays few social tendencies at this season although several pairs not unfrequently nest within a comparatively small area of exceptionally suitable country each nevertheless keeping to its own peculiar haunt this diver may also pair for life seeing that it evinces considerable attachment to certain favourite nesting places the nest is always made upon the ground and seldom very far from the water to which the frightened bird can retire readily an island covered with short herbage is always preferred in scotland but in some places the bare shingly beach is selected this nest often of the slightest construction is made of stalks of plants roots and all kinds of drifted vegetable fragments lined with grass sometimes no nest whatever is made the two eggs are narrow and elongated olive or rufous brown sparingly spotted and speckled with blackish brown and paler brown the sitting bird is ever on the alert to slip off into the water at the first alarm and sometimes both birds will fly round and round in anxiety for the fate of their treasured eggs a movement seawards is soon taken when the young are sufficiently matured this diver has a wide geographic range outside our limits extending across europe and asia to japan and northwest america perhaps as far as hudson bay american authorities however insist upon the specific distinctness of most of the black-throated divers found in alaska 
and have named this form C. pacificus. Red-throated diver. Smallest of the British divers, the present species, the Columbus septentrionalis of Linnaeus and modern authorities, is also the best known and the most widely distributed, is also the least showy neutral dress. In this plumage the throat is marked with an elongated patch of chestnut, the head and sides of the neck are ash-brown, the latter striped with black and white, the general colour of the upper plumage blackish-brown, sparingly spotted with white, and the underparts are white. The plumage, as in all the divers, is remarkably dense and compact, adapted in every way to the aquatic habits of the bird. The red-throated diver is a fairly frequent visitor, during autumn and winter, off the English coasts, often entering bays in the mouths of wide rivers. In summer, however, it becomes much more local, retiring then to haunts in Scotland, especially in the Hebrides, and along the wild and little populated western districts, from the Clyde northwards to the Shetlands. Outside our limits, this diver has a very wide distribution, occupying in summer the Arctic and north temperate regions of Europe, Asia and America, in winter migrating southwards for a thousand miles or more. The red-throated diver is certainly the most gregarious species, and in winter may not unfrequently be seen in gatherings of varying size. In connection with this trait, mention may be made of the extraordinary numbers of this bird that, on the 2nd and 3rd of December, 1879, past Heligoland. The movement was not strictly a migratory one, but a grand flight of storm-driven, frozen-out birds, seeking more congenial haunts. Gatke tells us that during this visitation there was about 13 degrees of frost, an easterly wind, and a snowstorm in the evening. The divers were by no means alone in their distress, for hundreds of thousands of duck, geese, and swans, curlews, dunlins, and oyster-catchers, passed from east to west. From early morning until noon, on both days in succession, the divers were seen in one incessant stream travelling north-east, in numbers estimated almost by the million. Well may Gatke have wondered whence such vast multitudes came, and whither they were going, and what was the initial cause of such gregarious instincts, never manifested in this diver under any ordinary circumstances. The red-throated diver is a master of the art of diving, and is often seen slowly to sink its body under water when alarmed. It also flies with great strength and speed, and is said to show more preference for flying than either of its congeners. The food of this diver is chiefly composed of fish. Its ordinary note is a harsh ack or hark, but at the nesting places the same wild unearthly cries are uttered that are equally characteristic of the other species. These cries are said to foretell rain or rough weather, and of course the bird to be called rain goose in many highland districts. The red-throated diver, however agile and graceful it may be in the water or even in the air, is a clumsy object on the land, incapable of walking upright, owing to the backward position of its legs, and compelled to shovel along with its breast touching the surface. In winter these divers are by no means shy, and I have many times watched them pursuing their fishy operations from my station on the cliffs. In May the red-throated diver retires to its breeding stations, the wild romantic locks and pools so characteristic a feature of the highlands and the Hebrides. Solitary pairs generally scatter themselves over the district, presenting intrusion and keeping to their own particular haunt. This diver probably pairs for life, returning each successive season to a certain spot to nest. An island is usually selected for the nest, which is invariably made upon the ground, and consists generally of little more than a hollow, into which is collected a few bits of withered vegetation. As may be expected, this nest is seldom made far from the water, so that at the least alarm the sitting bird can slip off and shuffle into the water at once. The two narrow, elongated eggs are olive or buffish brown, spotted and speckled with blackish brown and pale brown. Grebes in many respects, grebes are remarkable birds. They form so well-defined a group that no other known bird can possibly be confused with them, their characteristics being absolutely unique among the class aves. The most noticeable external features of a grebe are its relatively short body, laterally compressed tarsi, lobed feet, rudimentary and functionless tail, and dense compact plumage of a peculiar silky texture. Twenty or so species of grebe are grouped into a single family called Podicipedidae of which the genus Bodiceps, or more correctly, Bodicepes. The grebes are almost cosmopolitan. Five well-marked species are found in Europe, all of which, being visitants or regular residents, are included in the British avifauna. In the colours of their plumage, the grebes are not very remarkable. 
with the exception of the crests or tippets assumed by some species during the neutral period plain browns predominate on the upper surface the underparts are almost always glossy white the grebes fly well dive with great dexterity but their movements on the ground are not graceful the young are hatched covered with a close down and able to swim at once the grebes have a complete moult in autumn and assume their neutral ornaments in spring the quill feathers are moulted so rapidly that for some little time the birds are unable to fly as is the case with the geese and some others it is only during the winter months that the grebes become pelagic or marine in their habits and even some species are much less addicted to a sea life than others we will now proceed briefly to glance at the british species great crested grebe this the largest species the Podicipes cristantus of naturalists is chiefly an inland bird that resorts to the sea when fresh waters are frozen i have sometimes met with half a dozen together in a quiet bay under these circumstances and very graceful interesting birds they are they rarely come upon the land at these times swimming about and diving from time to time in quest of food like the divers they sometimes sink the body very low in the water but under ordinary conditions sit rather high with the long neck held well up the head turned at intervals in all directions as if on the lookout for enemies they always prefer to dive when pursued and as this species more especially is in great demand by plumisseries and subject to much persecution it is wary and shy in extreme the food of this grebe whilst on the sea is composed largely of fish but inland the bird's tastes are more omnivorous sometimes many of its own feathers are found in its stomach mixed with the food but as yet ornithologists have been unable to ascertain any plausible explanation of the fact in spring the adults assume two very conspicuous crests or horns of a dark brown colour and a tippet or ruff of bright bay shading into nearly black on the margin the birds now retire inland to meres and lakes where the shallows are full of reeds sedges rushes and other aquatic vegetation and here at some distance from the shore a large floating nest is made composed of dead and decaying vegetation as the bird is sometimes gregarious several nests may be often be found within a small area huge floating rafts moored to the reeds or built up from the bottom of the shallow water in a shallow depression at the top four or five eggs are laid elliptical in shape chalky in texture and white until contact with the bird's wet feet and the wet nest covers them with stains several mock nests are often made in the vicinity of the one containing the eggs probably destined as resting places for the future young the sitting bird very dexterously covers its eggs with weed when alarmed previous to slipping off the nest into the water the note of this grebe is a loud cack red-necked grebe this grebe the podicipes grisigena of bodar and the p rubricollis of most modern naturalists is a fairly common winter visitor to the seas off our eastern and southern coasts from the orkneys to cornwall the range of the red-necked grebe outside our limits is a wide one and embraces during the summer the sub-arctic portions of europe asia and america becoming much more southerly in winter during winter this grebe may be met with close in shore yet it seldom or never visits the land living exclusively on the sea its habits at this season do not differ in any marked degree from those of its congeners it may be seen swimming to and fro sometimes just outside the fringe of rough surf diving from time to time in quest of its food which in this season is composed of fish principally the neutral ornaments of this grebe are not so conspicuous as those of the preceding species the dark crests are shorter the tippet is scarcely perceptible and the lower neck and upper breast are rich chestnut in winter plumage this grebe is best distinguished by its large size necks in this respect to the great crested grebe and by the absence of the white streak over the eye which characterizes that bird then in april the red-necked grebe returns to its accustomed inland summer haunts to breed these are reed and rush fringed lakes and ponds here in the shallows a floating nest of rotten vegetation is formed smaller than that of the preceding species but otherwise closely resembling it many pairs may be found breeding close together in colonies so to speak the four or five elliptical shaped eggs are laid in may or june dirty white in colour chalky in texture the same habit of covering the eggs with weeds previous to leaving them may also be noted black-necked grebe this bird the bodicipes nigricollis of systematis is so rarely met with in the british area that it scarcely requires more than a passing allusion 
Examples occasionally occur on our eastern and southern coasts especially, but the bird is too rare to form any feature in the ornithology of the British seaboard. It may be readily distinguished from the other European groups by its sadly upcurved bill and by the large amount of white on the primaries and secondaries. In the neutral plumage, the head and neck are black. In its habits generally, it differs little from the other species. Scalovian Grebe Along the eastern coasts of England and round most of the Scottish littoral, as well as off Ireland, this species, the Podicipes cornutus of most naturalists, is of tolerably frequent occurrence during winter. It requires all the skill of an expert ornithologist to distinguish this grebe in winter plumage, so closely does it resemble the redneck species. It is a shorter winged bird, and has the three outermost secondaries dusky brown instead of white, as in that bird, whilst the previous species is always distinguishable by its upcurved bill. There is nothing in the habits of this grebe to call for special remark. It keeps exclusively to the water, dives to escape danger and to capture prey, and swims beneath the surface as adroitly as a frog. The Scalovian grebe is a wide-ranging species, inhabiting during summer months the Arctic and subarctic regions of Europe, Asia and America, retiring southwards in winter. This grebe is exceptionally remarkable for its neutral ornaments, but which, as usual, are confined to the head and upper neck. Two chestnut or bay coloured crests start backwards over the eyes, whilst the tippet is black. This ornament, when extended to its utmost, looks very beautiful, and gives the head an appearance of being surrounded by a glittering aureole. This grebe is a late breeder, the eggs not being laid before June. It retires to freshwater pools for the purpose of nesting, and resembles the other species closely in its habits at this season, making a slovenly floating nest, and laying four or five dull white eggs. Little Grebe this species is the smallest of the European grebes, and certainly by far the best-known member of the family found in the British Islands. It is rather remarkable that the little grebe was unknown as a distinct species to Linnaeus. It was known to Brisson as Columbus minor, and to most modern ornithologists as Podicipes minor, although some few writers speak of this bird as P. Pluviatilis. Outside the British Islands it has a very wide distribution in Europe, Asia and Africa, but the little grebe of America is a distinct species. The little grebe is found more or less frequently on the coast during winter, driven there too when frost seal up its inland haunts. On the coast this bird is more partial to the brackish backwaters, dikes and estuaries than to the open sea. The food of this bird consists not only of fish, but small crustaceans and mollusks, aquatic insects, young frogs and various vegetable fragments. Its habits are very similar to those of the other grebes, its swimming and diving powers are wonderful. Its flight on occasion is rapid and strong, whilst its note is a shrill but not very loud wheat. In its nesting economy, the little grebe closely resembles its congeners. It quits the coast in spring, resorting to inland pools, often of very small size, making its usually floating or water-surrounded nest amongst the vegetation fringing the shallows, on which it deposits five or six eggs, dull white in colour. The parents often dive with their young from the nest to carry them out of impending danger, a habit common to all species in this genus. Cormorants The grebes are so little in evidence to the seaside naturalists that an account of them seems more like a digression in our narrative than a continuation of our observations concerning the bird life of the sea. We now, however, reach another pelagic group, consisting of birds that form an important and seldom absent feature in marine ornithology. And yet, so great is the adaptability of some species, the cormorant is by no means exclusively confined to the sea, has many inland breeding stations, and repeatedly wanders from the coast to fresh waters, where an abundant supply of fish offers a solace to its great voracity. The cormorants and the gannet are members of the family Phalacrocoracidae, and are generally distinct from each other. Their principal external characteristics are the webbed feet, each toe, including the hind one, being connected by a membrane the long and powerful wings, and the strong beak. The young birds in this family are hatched naked and blind, but soon become clothed with down. The first plumage differs considerably from that of maturity, and the latter are not rarely retained for several years. These birds have but one actual moult in the year, in autumn, but just previous to the pairing season in winter, crests in some species, and ornamental filaments and tufts in others, are assumed, but are lost by abrasion during the ensuing breeding period. Three members of this family are British, and breed abundantly within our limits. Cormorants and gannets are widely dispersed species, the former are almost cosmopolitan, only being absent from the polar regions and Polynesia. 
the latter are most abundant in the tropics and the southern seas a detailed account of the three british species will now be given cormorant from the autumn onwards to the following spring there are few parts of the coast indeed where this bird the phalacrocorax carbo of ornithologists may not be seen whilst even in summer it is sufficiently widely dispersed to merit as classing it as common it is however seldom seen off low-lying coasts save after the breeding season or except such individuals as have not yet reached maturity there is but one other british species with which the cormorants may be confused and that is the shag but even then the difference in size is sufficiently great for the much larger cormorant to be readily identified very black very heavy and very clumsy the cormorant looks as he rises in slow cumbersome flight from the sea or unfolds his big bronze green wings and flutters into the air from a rock shelf or sea girdled pinnacle but very soon one's opinion of him undergoes a change as when once fairly on his way he passes swiftly enough over the sea to a distant resting place or after flying some distance pitches down into the water the colours of the cormorant are not seen to best advantage at a distance certainly the prevailing colour is black but this is richly loricated with green and purple tints whilst most of the upper plumage of the body is a beautiful bronzy brown the feathers being margined with soft velvety black shot with green the throat is white as are also the sides of the head whilst the bright yellow gape and bare portions of the throat form a pleasing contrast to the more sombre hues as the breeding season approaches the cormorant increases in beauty large white patches of silky feathers spring out from the thighs and the dark head and neck become covered by feathery filaments of white perhaps the cormorant is most interesting when engaged searching for food this bird obtains its food in various ways most frequently of all it swims to and fro diving with a headlong plunge at intervals sometimes it swims with its body low in the water and the head and neck below the surface peering about in quest of fish less frequently it takes up its station on a rock or even a tree from, from which it flies from time to time kingfisher-like to capture a fish near the surface or occasionally it dies from such a situation and pursues its finny food far down into the crystal depths the cormorant however never fishes like the gannets and the terns by a headlong plunge from the sky this bird may often be met with fishing in fresh water at some distance inland waterton records how it used to fish his lake at walton hall but the habits of the bird on sea and shore shall exclusively claim our attention here after a meal the cormorant is very fond of resorting to a rock to rest and to dry its plumage standing perfectly motionless with its wings uplifted and outspread few if any birds can excel the cormorant in diving it vies with the very fish themselves and seems as much at home beneath the surface of the water as in the air the cormorant when taken young is easily tamed and from the earliest recorded times it has been trained to capture fish for its owner to this day the chinese and japanese train cormorants for this purpose in england this sport was once a regal pleasure the master of the cormorants finding a place in the royal household according to professor newton the sport still lingers amongst a few willoughby asserts that the trained cormorant was carried hooded until cast off but nowadays its bearer protects his eyes from a stroke from the bird's beak with a wire mask a strap or a ring is fastened round the cormorant's neck to prevent it swallowing its captures just as we muzzle a ferret to prevent it lying up all who have witnessed this novel way of fishing testify to the bird's marvellous skill in catching fish after fish until the guller pouch will hold no more and the cormorant is taken and the fish removed the food of this bird is composed almost entirely of fish in winter cormorants become even more gregarious often associating in large flocks which wander far in quest of food this bird is not so completely pelagic in its habits as the auks the divers and the grebes it generally retires to the caves and shelves of the cliffs to sleep while stormy weather will drive it shoreward soon where it will sit and mope on the rocks or shelter in the quiet creeks or under the lee of cliffs as if waiting for the sea to subside and allow its labours being renewed as the cormorant returns for years in succession to one particular spot to breed there can be little doubt that it pairs for life the birds begin to associate closely in pairs somewhat early in spring but actual nesting duties do not commence for a little time after that event in most places the cormorant breeds in colonies the size apparently varying according to the amount of accommodation for the present purpose we need not describe in detail any of the inland nesting places of this species beyond remarking that the bird often breeds in trees like rooks making a huge nest of sticks and twigs lined with grass upon the coast the favourite breeding resorts of the cormorant are ranges of lofty cliffs and small low islands and reefs 
the nest may thus either be on the ground as at the farne islands for instance or on a ledge of the cliffs when in the former situation it is generally composed of masses of seaweed stalks of marine plants and lined with green grass or other herbage a cormorant's nesting place is by no means a pleasant one for persons whose olfactory nerves are sensitive a smell from the decaying fish and from the droppings of the birds can literally whitewash the whole vicinity being sickening in the extreme other sea-fowl generally give these colonies a wide berth the eggs are from three to six in number of a delicate bluish green where the colour can be detected through the abundant coating of lime small for the size of the bird and long and oval in shape when disturbed the sitting cormorants make little demonstration but fly out to sea at once but one brood is reared in the season and the eggs are deposited during april or may in the british islands the cormorant is a silent bird the only note i have ever heard it utter has been a croaking one at the nest shag this species the pelicanus graculus of linnaeus and latham and the phalacrocorax graculus of most modern writers is readily distinguished from the cormorant by its smaller size more glossy appearance and much greener general coloration shag differs structurally from the cormorant in possessing only twelve tail feathers the latter bird having fourteen the neutral ornaments are also very different for just previous to the breeding season in early spring an nodding plume or frontal crest of recurved feathers is assumed the shag is a much more marine bird than the cormorant and its appearance inland is exceptional of the two species the shag is certainly the commonest and most widely dispersed being met with off almost all parts of the british coasts but preference is shown for such as are rocky and where the ranges of cliffs are full of hollows and caves outside our islands the range of the shag is restricted to the coasts of western europe and the mediterranean basin as a rule the shag keeps well into the coast seeking for its food in the somewhat deep waters below the rocks and retiring to some fissure or cave to sleep its habits in most respects are very similar to the larger species it flies well and rapidly if in a somewhat laboured manner dives as skilfully as its ally and often indulges in the habit of sitting on the rocks with wings extended basking in the sun it is equally gregarious during the non-breeding season and it is no uncommon thing to see a hundred or more birds of this species sitting in solemn statuesque rows on some sea-encircled rock gorged with fish and digesting their food at these gatherings the birds may be noticed still fishing in the sea around or flying up to or leaving the rocky resting-place the young birds congregate indiscriminately with the adults a fishing shag is a very interesting object it may be watched quietly swimming along and every now and then springing half out of the water arching his long neck and then diving head first into the sea soon he reappears again the body coming into view all at once it may be close to where he dived or it may be fifty or a hundred yards away from the spot where he descended the shag feeds almost exclusively on fishes and these are chased through the water with incredible skill the bird may thus be watched by the hour together swimming and diving propelling itself by its feet and bringing the captured fish to the surface to swallow them at the approach of night the shag almost invariably betakes itself to the shelter of some cave or fissure and it is no uncommon sight along the rock-bound shore to see a dozen of the birds hurrying along close to the sea in silence towards the rocks where they sleep the shag breeds in may its favourite nesting haunts are the caves and fissures in the cliffs but where such are wanting or not available the bird will content itself with a cranny amongst the rocks of a low island if plenty of accommodation exists many pairs of shags will nest in company where suitable sites are scarce the birds breed in scattered pairs along the coast it is more than probable that the shag pairs for life it returns season by season to its old nesting place the nest of this species is either wedged into some crevice of the sides or roof or made upon a ledge in a cave sometimes a hole in the face of a wall-like cliff is chosen less frequently a site is selected amongst the rough boulders of a reef or even on a ledge of the cliffs where they overhang considerably in most cases the nest is bulky and made of sticks stalks of plants and seaweed lined with straws coarse grass and turf all more or less matted together with droppings decaying fish and slime and smelling most unpleasantly many nests are enlarged and patched up year by year the two three or four eggs are a little smaller than those of the cormorant of a delicate bluish green where the thick coating of lime does not conceal it the shag shows more reluctance to leave its nest than the cormorant does the effect is most startling as the big birds dash out of the gloomy sea caves one after another the only note i have ever heard the species utter has been a low croak gannet 
this remarkable bird differs in many important respects from all other pelagic species inhabiting the temperate portions of the northern hemisphere outside the limits of the british islands its only other breeding places in europe are on iceland and the faroes the gannet or salon goose the subla bassana of brisson and modern naturalists is one of the most pelagic of birds except during the breeding season it is rarely seen near land the thousands of birds that congregate in a few chosen spots round the british coast dispersing themselves far out to sea as soon as the duties of the year are over like the albatross the gannet may almost be said to live in the air its powers of flight are simply magnificent occasionally a few odd birds may be observed here and there fishing in the bays during autumn and winter but the person who would study its habits and movements thoroughly must visit one of its breeding places there are many colonies of gannets round the british coast one of the most accessible and perhaps the most famous being on the bass rock in the firth of forth there are small ones on lundy island and grassholm large ones on sulskerry sulisker st kilda alissa craig and little skellig the adult plumage of the gannock is white tinged with buff on the head and neck except the primaries which are black the bare skin round the base of the bill is blue the bird probably does not attain its white plumage until nearly four years old passing through a series of moulted stages of black brown and white the younger hatched blind and naked but eventually become clothed in dense white down other structural peculiarities are the closed nostrils and the subcutaneous air cells almost covering the body which the bird can fill with air at will as they communicate with the lungs whether seen at its nest or when fishing at sea the gannet is a remarkably interesting bird as may naturally be inferred a bird so light and buoyant as the gannet does not obtain its food by diving it is incapable of submerging itself even for a little distance except by gaining sufficient momentum from a plunge headlong from some distance in the air nevertheless the gannet feeds exclusively on fishes which it catches almost like a tern by dropping from a great height and seizing or impaling them with its strong bill the gannets follow the shoals of fish as they swim near the surface first one bird and then another will be seen to poise itself and then with closed wings to dash downwards glinting like a piece of white marble in the sun into the sea disappearing for a moment then rising again into the air to prepare for another descent many gannets at these times may perhaps be seen swimming but they are merely resting not fishing the captured fish is invariably swallowed at once visiting birds are kept well supplied with fish by their mates these shoals however are not conveyed to them in the bill but in the gullet from which they are disgorged and left by the nest side to be eaten as required very often a gannet will disgorge several large fish before leaving its nest whilst many more fish are brought to the rocks than are actually eaten the gannet is a voracious eater and often so gorges itself with food as to be incapable of flight the power of wing of this beautiful bird is wonderful in the extreme i have seen the gannet repeatedly keep the air for hours together apparently without effort wheeling in graceful curves and ascending to vast heights just as vultures are wont to do although the gannet is resident in british waters it seldom comes near land except to breed during the nesting season it is very gregarious and some of its stations contain many thousands of pairs early in the spring gannets begin to assemble at the breeding places and towards the end of april nest building commences the nests are made either on the ledges of the cliffs amongst the broken rock fragments at the summit or on the flat table-like tops of pinnacles and stacks where the birds are numerous and the accommodation limited great numbers of nests are crowded together and as may readily be inferred such close companionship leads to not a few battles between the birds themselves indeed a sort of guerrilla warfare is being waged constantly and is by no means one of the least interesting features of the never-to-be-forgotten scene the nest of the gannet possesses little architectural beauty and is generally so trodden out of shape as to resemble a mere heaped mass of rubbish caked together with droppings and slime and filth giving off an almost unbearable stench especially in a hot calm day in may and june seaweed masses of turf straws moss and stalks of marine plants are the principal materials the nest is shaped like a flattened cone the cavity at the top being shallow it is no unusual thing to see the bird adding to their nests even when incubation is in progress the gannet lays but a single egg but if this be taken as it often is especially in colonies easily accessible to man the bird will replace it several times in succession it is pale bluish green but generally so thickly coated with chalky matter and later with stains as to hide all traces of this colour there are few more noisy animated scenes in bird life than a gannet colony during the height of the breeding season the stirring sight once witnessed can never be forgotten the air for many yards from the face of the cliffs and high above it is filled with thousands of flying gannets 
every available spot on the edges and face of the rock itself is occupied by a gannet the standing birds vying with each other in uttering harsh cries the flying birds silently drifting to and fro in a mazy bewildering throng many of the flying birds are carrying nest materials many of the birds standing on the rocks are fast asleep on every side the gannets are eyeing you suspiciously some disgorging fish previous to taking wing others barking defiance as you approach them and stubbornly remaining upon their egg until absolutely pushed from it rock sea and air teem with birds it will however be remarked that none of the birds fly over the land all keep to the face of the cliffs at the bass rock numbers of young gannets used to be taken for food the proprietor baking quantities and selling them to the country people round about the taste for baked sullen goose however is not so prevalent as formerly and the custom seems likely to die out at st kilda however the gannet harvest still continues to be gathered and the young birds form a welcome article of food End of section 6